Like I said, uh, we're probably not going to get to all three things I want to do, but we're going to try to get to two of them. But we're going to have to move a lot quicker uh, in this section. So they arrest the apostles. That night an angel comes, opens the doors of the prison, and tells them, says to them, go out, stand in the temple, and speak. Right? More words. Speak out loud to the people what? These words, the words of this life. And we already know what that is because it's what's been said so far. It's kind of like a don't stop saying what you're saying. Remember, they just asked this prayer that they would be bold, that they would continue to speak. And he says, do keep saying the same thing. They enter the temple at daybreak and they begin to teach. The officers come. They don't find them. Someone comes and says, look, the men whom you put in the prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. And when they had set them before the council, the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you not to teach, right? Stop speaking. Don't say things about this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, notice the double entendre there a little bit. Wouldn't that be nice? Isn't that what they need? Is his blood to be upon them, and they refuse. They refuse it. Peter and the apostles answered, they speak out loud, we must obey God rather than men. Now, that's been said out loud by a few American preachers in the last uh, uh, two years or so with the Supreme Court ruling for us just happening down there. Well, we must obey God about marriage. But notice, the, where, what's the context? We must obey God, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. We're not going to stop speaking about this. You killed him by hanging him on a tree. Um... I could say something about this word obey. I haven't looked this one up particularly, but there's another one I did look up. Um, anytime you see the word obey in the New Testament, just the word of caution, it probably doesn't mean what English obey means anymore. English obey is a word that I think it's shifted over time, but it pretty much only means do it. Get it done. And the grounding of the word both in Hebrew and in Greek, as well as in the original English, is broader than that. It is really a, a believing word, a hearing word. Uh, I love the Greek word that is so clear. Hu akuo. The word for hearing is akuo, and the word hu on the front end means under. So it's under here. Be beneath the words of God. Not above. And so anytime you see this, just, just soften it with the fact that it's broader than do. We must be under God's words rather than under men's words. It's still a hard word, right? It just it, it contains the whole counsel of God in it this way. What words are we under that Christ is raised from the dead? God has exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. I, had, I didn't even see that before to look up what the leader is in the Greek. That would not be a common way of speaking about Jesus in the New Testament as the Fuhrer. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's, it's pretty big in um, American missiology these days to talk about leadership. Um, and there's a whole string of things on fascist ideology and how that's infiltrated American churches. We can go into that another time. But here, I think that the point of the section is the ascension. So we've already talked about Christ has risen, Christ has, uh, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again in the interim. He has ascended into heaven. This is God's decree. Uh, right now, he sits at the right hand of God, moving all things for your sake. Now, the American Christian would hear that to mean for the sake of my faith, for the sake of my happiness, for the sake of my pleasure. But that's not what he's doing. He's doing it for the sake of your salvation. Everything. Um, I, I was taught this by a, a friend of mine in seminary and way home from having a couple of beers one evening. Thursday evenings we'd get together and we'd drink a little and talk about what we were learning. And uh, we were commiserating about all the problems of the world and all the problems in the city and all the problems in the church and all the problems, all the problems, all the problems. All the problems. So, good seminarians do that from time to time. And um, he kind of, I, was, I was complaining about something very specific. I don't remember what it was. But I was talking about how I couldn't stand not being able to fix this. 
And he proved it to me. He said, yeah, God made it that way so that you could still be saved. And it was stunning how right he was that I was forced by my weakness to be under an ascended God, an ascended Christ, who wasn't going to give me what I wanted. Even though what I wanted, I think it's, I think it's so right, right? Like, it's in us. I think it's right. What are you doing? But he's doing that for the sake of all Christians in the church, that our faith would remain in him and not in what we've done. If he let us build a giant tower to heaven with the crucifix on it so that the whole world would come to us, we would just have a couple of that. This is what we've done. We've made a name for ourselves. Yeah. Fine. And so he doesn't let us do that. He doesn't let us hold masses in Madison Square Garden with hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, he kind of did, but not really. The Antichrist did that. What he gives us is this quiet gospel, scoffed at, hidden from the world. The good news that he's still behind it all, to give repentance and forgiveness. And we, the apostles, witnessed these things. They saw it. And so is the Holy Spirit a witness whom God has given to those, here's the obey, right? Who obey, which the, the, the Greek word there is not hupercool, but it also still has the meaning, the other end of the meaning being listen to him. It's given to all who listen to him. The danger with obey, if you can't see it there, is, well, if, if he gives the Spirit to you when you obey him, now we've just moved into the realm of justification by works, right? And this is a translation issue, um, not, a, not a textual issue. Um, story goes on, the message stays the same. I mentioned the Pope enough times today, he's in the news, that's why, but apostolic succession, this idea that the Pope is directly descended from the original apostles by a reign on a man chain, that's part of how his, his right to the church and to rule the church comes directly from Peter. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox also believe in this laying on of hands for the consecration of bishops. The Anglicans, the Episcopalians, they put all their marbles in being the, the right structure of the church that we've got the apostolic succession, this laying on of hands all the way back to the apostles. And the Lutheran church was forced to struggle with this early on because uh, we didn't have any bishops who converted. Uh, and so we were stuck with just a bunch of pastors. So what do we do to make more pastors? And uh, our understanding was, well, you know, if you look at the text carefully, a bishop is a pastor. And that the bishops in the churches were human-made institutions. More than that, the real apostolic succession doesn't come through the laying on of hands anyway. It's through teaching what the apostles taught. And you're going to see it, actually, in the text here. Um, Stephen and Philip, we skip here. Acts 6, there's too much room for the apostles. They take seven men, well-known among them. They lay their hands on them. What do you see Philip and Stephen and these men doing? The word of God and prayer. Um, what have they received that they continue to do? You don't see, um, at least yet here, uh, a miracle. I believe we will see one. But before that, you see Stephen dying and preaching as he dies. And he gives this sermon. It's very long. We will not go through all of it. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham and to everyone else in the Old Testament after him, and I will tell you their story for about 15 minutes. And he gets to the end, and his point is all the way down, there is rejection of this word. And so he turns and confronts the crowd, and he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. Notice that, uncircumcised in your ears. You can't hear you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced, outwardly spoke, beforehand, the coming of the righteous one, whom, there it is, you have now betrayed and murdered. There's the crucifixion. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. That word keep can mean watch or guard or cherish or cling to. Now he doesn't proclaim the resurrection. Notice that. He just has the crucifixion. Um, there's no conversion either. They just kill him. And he dies and heaven opens, he sees Jesus. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church, and they were all scattered. Those who were scattered went about doing what? Preaching the word. 
So Philip, another one of these deacons, early pastors, I'd say, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard, and here's the signs, he does do some signs, when they heard and saw the signs that he did, but it wasn't the signs that were the point. It's what he said. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many. And the spirit said to Philip, go over, join this chariot. So Philip ran over to the chariot uh, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, he spoke, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? Again, unless, uh, unless someone explains the text to me, speaks out loud about what it means. Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with the scripture, he told him, and now we should know what this means. The good news about Jesus. That's everything that's been said about Jesus so far in this book. Not the Bible first, right? But in Acts. What's been said about Jesus so far? Appreciate that. Thank you. What's been said about Jesus so far in the book of Acts? Which I've already shown you, right? Death, resurrection, ascension, coming again. It seems he also told them about baptism. Because as they were going along to the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Strange question unless you've been told about baptism. Yeah? Um, so clearly there was a conversation about that going on as well. It continues. Peter later opens his mouth. Another sermon. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. This is to the, um, the centurion's family who had the visions. and got, Peter gets the vision of the animals that he gets to eat and all this. It's about, and this is the moment in the book where we're, we're transitioning from the Jew to Gentile reality, uh, from uh, Israel to the nations. God shows no partiality amongst humans. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what has happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God Christed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. But that wasn't the point. Here's the point. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. Who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So there he gets to the meaning of it as well. I should have had that in blue, the forgiveness of sins. Um, right here, uh, this word peace. Then... Uh, struggling with some of the people in my parish, getting to know each other, and one of the, the ideas that we're wrestling with, and we just haven't heard before, is helpful. Is that peace in the Bible is not peace in the 1960s rock and roll. I've got that peacefully healed in the song. Uh, it's a great uh, extension of an old American spiritual uh, that came from the river in my soul. Um, the peace the Bible speaks of is rarely a matter of your will. It is an external reality. It is the fact that God is no longer at war with you. The peace of Christ is a promise that God is for you and not against you. Now, if you believe that, will it give you a peaceful, easy feeling? Sometimes it will. Uh, sometimes it won't. Uh, but it's a reality you can count on. There's a ceasefire between you and God with regards to judgment day. A truce. Yeah? pretty cool, <laughs> if you think about it. It's way better than a peaceful feeling, because those come and go. Um, it's good stuff. The good news of peace through Jesus. Harmony with God. God not against us, but for us. God anointed Jesus for this, to be hung on the tree, raised from the dead, made to appear, and not to all. So that um, not to all people, this is important. You do not get to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation personal connections and him leading you by your emotions up and rises or whatever answer you need. He didn't appear to everybody. He appeared to his chosen witnesses. And we <coughs> are like Thomas, although Thomas got to see him too. But the words given to Thomas, do you believe because
because you see blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, you should really include in that blessed are those who have not felt the presence of the Holy Spirit and still believe. Blessed are those who in the midst of their depression, their despair, their frustration, their anger, their sin, still believe he's risen from the dead and that this is their righteousness. Huh? The witnesses were appointed. And our witness today, as I've said, is to point to their witness. Trustworthy source. These guys saw it. It happened. What does it mean? Forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. That God overlooks who I am for the sake of who Christ is. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Later, there's a shift from Peter to Paul, and this is connected to this Judea to the nations shift. Paul is converted, uh, so that whole story is taking place. Um, and you know, Paul made up his own religion, right? Um, I don't know if you hear liberals will say anything, I guess. It's like, oh, uh, one, of the, one of the things they'll throw out there is that early Christianity you know, wasn't what we see today. What we see today um, was something Paul made up later on his own, and the other apostles and Jesus himself would never have known this. It's a very radical thing to say. But um, what I think is fascinating is here we have Paul. He's going to say what he thinks. And it's going to be the same thing we've heard Peter say. It's not going to shift much. It's a little the language will change, but not much. So Paul and his companions, they come to Perga, Sabbath day. This is kind of how they did mission. The same, the same pattern that God followed of Judea to the nations. They follow in every town they go. They go synagogue to the streets. This is not necessarily a pattern we have to follow, but it is what they did first. He went to the Jew, then to the Gentile. He does get to the point where he just kind of washes his hands of the Jews um, and goes to the Gentiles. Um, but here he is in the synagogue. There's a reading from the law and the prophets, pretty standard. He's asked to speak. He stands up and he speaks. He speaks out loud. Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of Israel raised up David to be king of this man's offspring. God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised out loud. Brothers, to us has been sent the message the news of this salvation for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, but fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is complained, is complained, is proclaimed to you. Um, beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, sorry about the font, uh, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your day as a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. I should have made that in bold underline. And as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. Oh man, that would just melt your pastor's heart. Dear pastor, please speak of the death and resurrection of Jesus next week. Please. Was it not this week? Didn't I say that this week? Yes, do it again. Yeah, do it again. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So you see, he does change his style. Yeah? It's, not the, it's not a direct quote, but it is the same creedal message. It is that second article of the creed. Notice the mentioning of Pilate. Why is Pilate so important? Pilate's a real person in history. It's a real time, a real place. This is not an idea. Yeah? Christianity. Oh, so, I, I remember that. I think it's All, right. All the religions of the world, world paganism, it's all ideas, assertions, constructs. I don't, I don't care how you want to say it. It's all uh, words that float out in the air, and you have to take those words and assess them for their truth based on how well they work or fit together. Christianity.
Christianity is not an idea. It's a fact of history. It's George Washington crossing the Tiber. Not the Tiber. That was right after. <laughs> Yes, but they hinge on the event. Even Islam. Islam gets close, because they have a prophet who they claim is historical, but really their religion is not founded on his historicity. It's founded on the ideas he taught. Um, when Christians talk about Christianity just being about love and the golden rule, they're falling into paganism. And they're falling into the, the world's way of seeing religion. Now, what was the temptation? Why do we like this more? Because this is about me, ultimately. Right? I, can, I can use this for my benefit. Whereas this is always about him. Always. So they're not proclaiming an idea. They're proclaiming an event. Multiple events if you think about the end of the world, too. Right? That there is another event coming. Did I say this is my favorite yet about which one we're looking at? Um, I, I tend to say that about a lot of things. This is my favorite. Um, this is one of my favorites. Because uh, this is the one that, like, the liberalizing, the liberal helping political, I mean, not trusting the Bible, which is me and I. The liberalizing tendency of missiology and love of this text. Because this is the one where we can just say, yes. It's true, it's about Jesus, but you can't just go say that. You gotta change it to help people understand that people are just dumb. And they don't say that. But it's, it's the gist. The average pagan is too dumb to understand Jesus uh, as written in the dead. He needs parables. That's why Jesus spoke in parables, because people were dumb. Um, that's actually not why Jesus spoke in parables. He spoke in parables to confuse people. Kind of um, not so that they would understand. Um, now here, Paul, he's not going to speak in a parable, but he is going to, at the start of his sermon, have a contextual reality. He's going to talk about something in their life before he gets to the other stuff. But what I want you to see, what, what's done normally, he says, well, therefore, that's what we got to do. Rather than go somewhere and speak about Christ crucified and Christ risen, we first have to, like, put it in their language and shift it so they understand. What I want you to see is if you're going to take that from this text, it means you ignore the first half of it. Because before he ever gets to the point where he's asked to speak and then contextualizes, he's already talking about the resurrection. In the street. <laughs> Crazy. Paul was nuts. Man, I wish I had his conviction. Um, they come to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue. Um, Paul goes in. On three Sabbath days, he reasons with them from the Scriptures, explains, proves, it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Because of persecution as a result of this, again, the same proclamation in the synagogue, he has to flee and goes to Athens. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. <sighs> There's a phrase, ah, we read it around Easter time, somewhere in Lent. It's a condemnation from the prophets. It's, God says, but you do not weep uh, for the desolation of Joseph. Um, to be aware of just how wicked it is. His soul is provoked by it. He's not mad about homosexuality. He's mad about the second commandment being broken. The people are worshiping a God who they don't even know, which is what American Christians are doing a lot. In God we trust. I pledge allegiance under God. Who are we talking about? His soul was vexed by this false religion. So, he reasoned in the synagogue, reasoned, that's talking out loud, with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others say, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So you have these Epicureans, the guys who basically believe that there is no truth, so all there is is the moment, so enjoy it while you can, which is kind of what they understood. Right? 
They had the Stoics, who are in a little bit of a different bed. They don't really believe there is no truth, but they believe they can't change everything. So just deal with whatever comes and do your best, because it's neither good nor evil. It's kind of weird. Um, and both of these guys, they're out in the streets walking, doing their shopping in the Greek marketplace, and along comes some Hebrew saying, God, I forgot to hear this. Uh, there was a guy coming in, there was one of these guys, and I forgot to tell you Who are you? Yeah? What are you talking about? Now, what is this babbler saying? You can't stop talking about the resurrection of Jesus, and it doesn't make any sense to them. That's the whole point. It doesn't make any sense to the pagan. It is a scandal to them. It is, it is lunacy. He, Paul says this himself in 1 Corinthians. The foolishness of the cross. If Christ is not raised from the dead, we are to be pitied. We have a false religion. He can't stop talking about it. So that's why then they bring him to the Areopagus, this place of discussion in Athens. Kind of a cool spot. If you ever go there, you can visit it. Um... May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, part of that is that all of Greek philosophy at this point has pushed to um, each behind both Epicureans and Stoics a belief that the physical world isn't really the real world. It's here, but it's kind of wrong. And duh, it looks broken, right? I mean, it's rust and all that stuff. Storms and all that. And so it's sort of more of a reflection of the world that ought to be. The real world. Uh, the, 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 the true substance is somewhere else. It's like we're in a shadow. And so our bodies are a part of this problem. And the real us is not body, but, but spirit, but the, the, the divine that's within. No, there are different levels and ways in which they go at this, but it's really the heart of Greek thought. Um, and so what that means is that when you die, your body is this, is this husk, is this shell that's left behind, and you go to the real place. So you can see how then the preaching of the resurrection of the cross is really here to them. I think it's pretty much a catechism of this. Yeah? Um, how, how, do you, how do you make any sense of this thing? Now for the Hebrew, it's very different. The body and the resurrection has always been in the Hebrew mind. Um, uh, so I won't go into that too much, but this is why they're so curious at first. Um, but he's going to get to the resurrection again, and the end result will be, generally speaking, they think it's pretty funny. It, it, good laugh. Good show, Paul. Uh, cheers. You know, Maybe come back in a couple years, do it again. Yeah. Um, he, he does get a couple converts. Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. That's his context. That's the big, the big moment where he talks about something other than Jesus that gets to Jesus. Um, I don't know. It's basically he's telling them all pagan unbelievers don't know what we're talking about. I hardly see it. He says, you know, speaking in the heart of you or anything like that. Um, He's straight up just telling them that I perceive you're worshiping stuff, but you're worshiping the wrong stuff. So here, I'll tell you what you should worship. Um, I just skipped where I'm at now. The Lord God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Right, all of your pagan worship is a joke. That's what he just said. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. So, again, that part about feeling your way toward him, he's not speaking positively about that. He's saying that's where paganism comes from. So 
The result of you having a statue of wood or stone that you're actually calling your God is the best you can come up with when you're on your own to find God. You end up worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Right? Romans 2. Um, the times of ignorance God overlooked. Okay? The God who made you isn't burning you to a crisp yet for this. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Huh? There it is again, the resurrection. He didn't, even, he didn't mention the cross this time, just the resurrection. Now, what I really think is interesting, so I don't know, I'd have to look at the Greek more. Judge the world in righteousness so we'll do a little, a little lesson on the opinion of Legos here. We have a bad habit that the Lutheran Fathers called the opinion of Legos. You guys like Latin? I do like Latin. Latin's good. Um, you know the word opinion. You know from Latin. What's it mean? Opinion. There you go. Vikings. Legos, you probably know this one too. It's not Legos. It's that little box. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know. What, what, what can I compare? I know we use this word in other places. Legislation. legislation. There you go. Go good. What legislation is making wow. law, right? So the opinion of the law is their way of describing probably the worst facet of our concupiscence, our tendency towards sin, is that whatever we're going to judge truth, if we have to put it in the category, we're going to put it in the category of what I'm supposed to do, rather than the category of what the sacrament is true and what I am given by grace of the opposite side. And so you, we do this in the Bible all the time, I think. We, we come to a passage like, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, and we think, oh, that means he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, and whether you're good or evil, you'll be separated based on whether you're good or evil. So the righteousness there is, is my righteousness. Right? He's going to judge us based on how righteous we are. There's another way to read the text. He's going to judge the world based on the righteousness of the one man. He's going to judge the world for him. That's all. Right? You ever get this when we, uh, we say it in the Creed, but it, it struck me most in the, um, the Today on the Old. I don't know how old it is. The, the medium old Today on the Prama, originally the blue hymnal. Uh, it's now an LSD. Um, but the language in there, it struck me. End of the text. We're singing, He will come again to be our judge. And I said, Why am I happy about that? He's going to come be my judge. Well, why I'm happy about that is because I know what the judgment is. I forgive you. I forgive you. We have the judgment come early. You are righteous in Christ. And so we can sing about it. He's going to come again back to be righteous. He's going to take away my sin in experience rather than just as a promise by faith. And so I do think, I'd want to look at the Greek more here, but it's a good chance. This isn't necessarily about us, right? That he's actually proclaiming the external righteousness of Jesus, who is appointed, and the assurance of this in his resurrection. Yeah? Um, when they heard of the resurrection, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So some do listen. But this idea is not always in season, as I started out earlier today, right? There is a, there's a time and a place where it will not be heard. And... I mean, we've, we, I've skimmed over it. They've been being persecuted this whole while. They're not just being ignored. Today, we're just ignored, generally. They're being persecuted for it. What would the church growth movement do with that? They say change the message when they ignore you. So what do you do when they've got a sword at your throat? Or they're throwing stones at your head? Do you change the message? To try to get more people in the church for God? So we can say, look what we've done. Lord, we did many good things in your name. We cast out demons and did many miracles, built many churches. I never knew you, he says to those. Right? Where is our confidence? It's in these words about the Christ, outside of us. <coughs> Acts 20. Here we have the only time uh, that there's really more going on. What was this thing to like a Christian church sermon? Uh oh. Did I just lose my power? I do have a power source. Because we have power source. We lost the computer. No, we lost the computer. We lost the computer.
I was wondering about that. I thought it would last two hours. Now it's going to be mad at me and be like, no, you wore me out. I don't want to turn on. It's, it's not, oh, there we go. Yeah, 1%. All right. He's actually going to have uh, more than just the resurrection because he is talking now to a group of Christians, and there will be some expectation. Um, although I don't think, there's a little bit of an argument going on these days, it seems to be very concerned about the place of expectation in, in the church. And, um, our confessions are pretty clear. We need the law, period. We need to be speaking what the law is. Um, but it's the danger is thinking that exhortation is a means to becoming a better Christian. That's not what Paul's doing here. He's actually encouraging them in the midst of grief um, and, and asking them and their friends to act a certain way because of the reality that's going to come upon them. That's really different than like. You know, grow in your sanctification and become more righteous. It's not really the way he's talking, but it, there is exhortation here, so I don't want to ignore that. Um, he's on his way back to Jerusalem. He knows when he gets there, he's going to be taken and, and probably not see people again, probably get murdered. Um, so he has this moment with the elders in Ephesus who cared about him. He'd spent many years in Ephesus and, and no doubt had some very strong friendships and ties there. So they came to him. He said to them, you yourselves know how I did not shrink from declaring. Again, notice again, bam, bam, bam. Words outside of my mouth. Declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming, I should have folded that one, proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. Therefore, I testify outside, I speak words to you this day, that, um, uh-oh, dot, 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 I, I don't know, testify this day. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So that's his, his testimony, is that I've told you everything that you need to know. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, overseers, pastors, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And there's your crucifixion. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, here's your exhortation, be alert Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. Um, so before he goes on to talk about kind of the, the actions of the Christian life, notice the, rate, the, the, the first exhortation is to watch out for false teachers who will steal grace. They'll steal the gospel. They'll steal the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's what they're going to steal first. Right? Um, the inheritance. Paul talks about this idea in a number of places, about our, our birth in the new age as something we inherit because Christ inherits it and we are in him now. And if you think about this as a, as a, um, a symbol, who chooses their inheritance? Who gets to decide it? Who, who earns it? It's not a matter of any of those things. It's a matter of being born into a man. And that birth is justification through the cross, resurrection. Our baptism is our unity with that reality. He commends them to this, saying God will give you this inheritance, those who are sanctified. Sanctified is a fine word. 
problem is it has more than one meaning in English. So it can mean holy or it can mean righteous. And the thing is, these are not the same. There is a connection between the two. One who is truly holy will be righteous. Um, but this holiness is um, a proximity word. It's a local word. Uh, it's about nearness to the actual physical God. Um, which, if you are unrighteous, burns you up. <laughs> right? And that's why there is a connection between the two. But our holiness as Christians, our, our, our sanctification as Christians, is also, by grace alone, through faith alone, at its root. The resulting new obedience of a good action of Christian life, it certainly flows from this faith. But again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul proclaims that Christ has become our justification and our sanctification. If you want to talk about righteousness, that's the justification word. Um, so when he says here to all those who are sanctified, again, don't hear this as meaning those who are righteous enough to inherit the kingdom. He means those who are in Jesus. Those who are set apart in Jesus. Now, he will talk about, I mean, look, and, and think about all the battles Paul's had to defend himself against the accusations. The Corinthian letters are written entirely to defend himself against those who are saying, Paul just wanted your money. And that's the only reason he came at all. So here he says, I coveted no one's silver or gold. You yourselves know these hands ministered uh, to my necessities and to those who were with me. And all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. I'm really curious. I didn't spend enough time on this, trying to see the connections in here for what he's saying up above. Because there's a, there's a weird thing we can do with the opinion of the law with this blessed to give than to receive thing. Is that we then say, oh, since it's more blessed if I give than receive, then if I do a bunch of giving, then I'll get a bunch of stuff. Right? So we want to go be blessed to get things. Which is like what this saying is wrong, right? And then also, if you think about this too, is Jesus comes and he says, I've come to seek and save the lost, I've come to give, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm like, oh, can I get in that place and give? When he's the one who is giving first. Now, there is a reflection of this in the Christian life, to be sure. And he says, remember the weak among you, right? That we would see here gathered at the altar, at the cross, that we are all the same weakness. We are all the same neediness. There is no one of us who is more worthy to be there. Having our own eyes open by this grace, I can't wait for a few minutes a week, not judge my neighbor personally as I normally do, and try to see his needs a little bit. Um, so there is definitely that there. Um, notice now, even with this, even with this exhortation, and in this sermon, with, as far as it's recorded, with this exhortation, remember the week. What's at the heart? What does he want them not to forget? The blood, right? The blood of Jesus. And going forward, the message continues. Um, the city gets stirred up down in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul addresses the crowd, being zealous for God as all of you are this day, I persecuted this way, Christianity, to death. As I drew near to Damascus, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and the Lord said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came to Damascus. So here's his actual testimony of his eyewitness account. Right? He's not to the resurrection yet, but he'll get there. Um, the next day, Desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, uh, the guy who had captured him, the, the Roman uh, prefect, uh, that's the wrong word, but you get the idea, um, unbound him and command, commanded the chief priests and the council to meet, brought Paul, set them before all of the official leaders of the Jews. So he's trying to figure out why they were trying to kill him. When Paul had perceived that one part of the crowd were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. I just love this. And some of the Pharisees are one of the best Christian names. It's amazing. Uh, because the Sadducees are not over Israel yet. And so they get in a fight with each other. Oh no, he's fine! Don't give that him! Right? So it's really clever on Paul's part. But at the same time, notice, it's still the same message. 
It is with respect to the resurrection of Jesus that I am on trial. That is the message I can't stop speaking about. So they, they rise up, they get divided. The Sadducees say there's no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. They're like ancient liberals, what the Sadducees were. Um, uh, then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong in this man. Again, the Pharisees are saying we find nothing wrong in this man. And they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're just being politicians at this point. Um, what if a spirit or angel spoke to him, right? Yeah, yeah, what if? Huh? Jeez. So he ends up later, you know, through this, he appeals to Caesar. So he ends up in prison, having to wait a while. He gets to talk to two different kings while he's there. Um, one of them is Felix. I don't know if Felix is the king. I think he is. No, no, no. Felix is the governor. I don't remember. Um, Paul replies, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Yeah, the king, Agrippa is the king that's with him. Um, I cheerfully make my defense. So he's, he's defending himself before a pagan now. Uh, and, but Agrippa is not. Agrippa is Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these themselves, these men themselves accept, which is that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. I'm sorry, Agrippa's not here. He's coming up. See, I, why I'm confused is because there's another F guy who's with Agrippa. It's Felix is the first one, and then there, who's the other one? Festus, right? Yeah, that's why I got confused. Um, so Felix wants money and just leaves Paul in prison. Festus comes along and thinks Paul is kind of interesting to, to listen to, so he shares Paul with Agrippa, this Hebrew mini-king, uh, not a real king, um, uh, who's down. But again, before we go on, can it get more clear? The message, over and over and over again, Christ has been raised from the dead. When some days have passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. Uh, as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow he said you'll hear him. So Paul comes, he stretched out his hands, and he made his defense. Again, speaks out loud. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by the Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I can't believe that's not read. God raises the dead. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Ah. And I did so in Jerusalem, and not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, probably a reference to Stephen. Uh, and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen on the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? Which is, Who are you, God, by the way? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to these things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. You thought I wasn't going to get to it, didn't you? That the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both to our people and to the nations. Gosh darn it, the same sermon again. You know? It's just, there's only one message. As he's saying these things in defense, Festus cries out. I love this part too. Paul, are, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Right? Resurrection, are you crazy? We all know the body's a dead husk. And Agrippa said, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> Paul said, short or long, I went to God that not only you, but also all who hear me, hear the words, this day might become such as I am except for these chains. Okay. Would have this faith. Would know this truth, this fact. Um, there is more to the book of Acts, but I believe this is the last major sermon uh, that is there. You can go back to Luke and you can see the same thing. Uh, only there is Jesus consistently saying that the entire Old Testament is fulfilled in the Christ suffering, dying, and rising again. No one believed him. They struggled with it. Uh, Mark makes a point uh, in the middle of the gospel multiple times with three predictions. At each time, they're pretty much followed by a complete uh, moronic response. They just they can't fathom what he's talking about. And this is where the Holy Spirit actually comes in. We can sometimes get accused of having a weak doctrine of the Holy Spirit that did not belong to Adam and Adam and Jacob and Mary out of the um, I think they have a weak doctrine of the Spirit because their Spirit is one of the Word, it's one of power and vision and sight. And our Spirit is a faith alone. And this is the powerful, amazing thing. Just think of this every place where Christ is proclaimed as having to die and rise without the Spirit, people don't believe it. means the Holy Spirit did in fact work in time. It couldn't be otherwise. You would be laughing and snickering at the other. Or you'd be so angry that you'd want him to shut up. That's the Spirit's great power. And it's just as big perfect as we can be. You don't even know it's there. Right? Other than that, you hear this good news as good news. Great news. It's hope. And his brothers begin to uh, see, as we've talked about this morning, uh, the limitations of this age. And if there is a weakness in, in our, I think, life together as church, it is that we don't encourage one another and not with the end of the world. We, we get disturbed by what's going on, by all looking like it's going to hell. When we should be encouraged as we see the day approaching, soon it will be over. Soon we're going to go home. Soon we're going to visit the Fatherland. Right? Um, encourage one another with these words, Paul says. And he is, even in that context, talking about the coming resurrection of the dead. Um, in our next hour, I'll just flip to the starting point here and maybe introduce it. With this all being said about the resurrection... I want to spend some time talking about the apologetic, the defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, we looked at how the Spirit makes Christians by proclaiming the witness. What's kind of neat is it can actually step outside of the matrix and test the claims of the resurrection based on the best of historical science that we have. I'm going to try to explain some of that. And it holds up the scripture better than just about any other claim in the ancient world. I don't think this will convince your antagonistic friends to believe, um, but it's wonderfully good at helping you not be convinced by any non-believers. Uh, 
Uh, and so we're going to spend some time looking at that uh, evidence for resurrection, uh, which even an atheist really is the honest thing we can sort of accept uh, as evidence. We may not believe it, but that's what we're doing. So we'll do that when we come back. Um, so I'm going to stop just a few minutes early again. Um, and uh, we're back at, I don't have it written here. 11, when? 11? 11 o'clock. So, wait, see you in a bit. <laughs>